Let's talk about tilting. How many people are familiar with that term? Okay, I think that's a show of a, a hand from every person in the room, which is great. What does it mean, really? Let's think about that. Now, the Estill model proposes a tilted thyroid posture as a prerequisite for that cry quality. Inside the larynx, we have muscles that shorten the vocal folds, and that is the TA, or the vocalis muscle. TA means thyroarytenoid. I'm going to use the acronyms as we go through, otherwise my talk will be even longer than planned. Okay? And we have muscles that lengthen the vocal folds. These are the cricothyroid muscles, or the CT muscles. So TA shortens and bulks the vocal folds, also stiffening them, and I'll be talking about what muscle stiffening is in due course. And CT elongates, thins, and also tensions the vocal folds. So I want to show you a typical representation of how that might look in the larynx. Let's see if I can get the pointer working. And it's that red button there. Okay, so what you've got here is the rest position. So this is the non-tilted position where there's actually a gap, it's a very small gap, between the uh, thyroid and cricoid cartilage. That's the muscle that's been positioned there. And for the, um, the solid line, you've got the tilted position. So this is a tilted forward position. If I represent it just with my hands, it's very common that you see people describing it in this way. Okay. But functionally, this can also happen. Now, this is a diagram, diagram from Netta. The first one is uh, from Ron Bacon, and the second one is from Netta. I will give you all the references for these in the transcript so that you can look them up for yourself. Now, what's interesting about this is it looks like it's the wrong way around, doesn't it? Okay, so now what we've got, uh, in this case, the tilted position the elongation of the vocal folds is the dotted line. So because of these muscle bands that we have and the articulation of the joint of the cricoid and the thyroid, we have two possibilities for stretching and, elong and thinning the vocal folds. We can either do this or we can do that. They both achieve exactly the same effect. And the important thing for you to know is that according to the Harris Voice Clinic, uh, authors of the Voice Clinic Handbook, some singers do it one way and some singers do it another. So these variations of movement are actually incredibly important because if we are going to teach our students to tilt, we need to avoid misdirecting them. Suppose you describe only the forward tilt of the thyroid and your student does it the other way round. They're going to be desperately hunting for that tilted position. Interesting thought, eh? We all, excuse me. We also need to bear in mind that the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, and we're talking here about two sets, the um, TA, vocalis muscle, and the cricothyroid, and there are many others. Those intrinsic muscles of the larynx don't go it alone. We can't just work one without the others doing something. All the intrinsic muscles of the larynx are served by the vagus nerve. There are two branches of the vagus nerve, and it so happens, which is quite interesting little factoid if you're a voice geek, is that the, um, the nerve that serves the cricothyroid muscle is different from the nerve that serves all the others. So we have a superior laryngeal nerve that serves the cricothyroid, but all the other intrinsic muscles are served by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, which actually runs through the heart. So we have to bear in mind that although we like to think we have independent control over these groups, we're not just using one muscle at a time. And I'm sure Marcia's gonna have something to say about that later on this weekend. I certainly hope so. Okay, let's have a look. So I've already talked about the effect on the vocal folds that they will be elongated, thinned, and tensioned. 
Okay, this is a nice bit of research that was done by these two authors, a husband and wife team. They were looking at cadavers, as you do if you're a medical person in, in the speech sciences, and uh, they, they tested the effect of the cricothyroid muscle, and what they found was that it can alter the length of the vocal folds by around about 25%. That's a lot. You know, imagine holding an elastic band in your hand and pulling it 25% longer. Stay with me. I'm not suggesting that the moment we engage the tilting mechanism that we go straight to 25%. There's, there's every uh, reason to indicate that we do it incrementally. Okay. Just got to check where I am in terms of slides. So when we tilt, just hold in your mind the idea of an elastic band that we're pulling and stretching. We change the mass per unit length of the vocal folds. This is really important. We all have a resting length of our vocal folds. We engage the cricothyroid mechanism. We're going to change the mass, the thickness of the vocal folds. And lots of you are probably familiar with that. Okay, we tilt and we thin the folds. That's great. But you know what? A longer, thinner vocal fold is set to vibrate faster. You've only got to think about a string, you've only got to play with your elastic band, and that's what it does. And the faster speed gives us a higher pitch. So now this brings us to a little bit of a conundrum when we're thinking about holding a tilted set, as for cry, all the way across our phonational range. Following me? Good. Okay. So we need to think about, because if we want to maintain the same pitch, and this is, one, this is one of the figure exercises, by the way, for those of you who don't know, you sing a particular note without tilt and then with. The idea is that you have this independent control. And it's interesting when you think about the effect and what's known in the literature about what happens with the cricothyroid mechanism. Because if you're going to tilt and you want to maintain the same pitch, some type of reset will be needed in the larynx. Other muscles are going to have to engage. Otherwise, you are going to change pitch. So if it is our intention to take the cry quality across the vocal range, I'm going to suggest that what we need to think about is how efficient or inefficient might it be to hold that tilted set across the entire range. How well is it going to work in the lower range where the vocal folds actually prefer to be shorter and thicker? And what should we do when the vocalis muscle has reached its maximum tensile capacity? In other words, we can't stretch it any further because all muscles have that. If we haven't yet reached the top of our range, wouldn't it make more sense to reset by moving into a falsetto where the, vo the vocal fold mass is looser and then re-engage the tilting muscles, then re-engage the CT so we can stretch further. And from a clinical standpoint, which I, I'm rather hoping that Linda will cover because we've had a little conversation about my topics, is that if you're going to maintain a hold on a tilted larynx, even for classical singing, it might lead to what we call a muscle tension dysphonia. Muscles like to be switched off. They don't like to be fired the whole time particularly if we're directed to do so with effort. Mm 